Okay, let's go ahead and dive into this lesson. In this lesson, I'm going to be discussing the surface of Mars and the planet Mars in general. Now, when I first became interested in the topic of Mars, it was really what sparked my whole interest into the ancient astronaut theory. I'm 39 now, and when I first started looking into these topics at 21, someone had just kind of tangentially mentioned to me in college that there was, hey, this face and pyramids on the surface of Mars. Well, I, of course, didn't you know, see any interest or belief in this information until I started to, for whatever reason, look into some of the data that's been coming down from what we have on imagery that we get of the orbiters going around Mars. I think at the time, basically, I became aware of a certain company called Malin Space Science Systems. And Dr. Mike Malin, who runs this uh, company, was also located in San Diego, where I was attending college. And it turns out that most of the cameras that we've been placing on the orbiters to take pictures on the ground as well as in orbit uh, were from Malin Space Science Systems. So this was very intriguing to me, and I decided to contact Dr. Mike Malin as a college student and just ask him point blank, is there any possibility that is there any possibility that there are artificial structures on Mars? And he said, well, no, there's only sand and weather eroded objects, which some have portrayed to think look like a face and pyramids. That, of course, raised my eyebrows even further in curiosity because I was able to find five to ten peer level review scientists that might not work at NASA, but hold PhDs in image analysis and satellite telemetry, where just doing some simple fractal math patterns or some simple algorithms that you can run on satellite telemetry, which we'll see in today's lesson, we clearly see that the areas of Mars called Cydonia definitely merit further attention. Okay, so, you know, if we just kind of look at some basic facts about Mars, we can see that it's about half the diameter of Earth, and really it started to catch attention even before, you know, the last 50 years of our science, but back in the day, uh, there was a gentleman named uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli, that was an Italian astronomer, and you know he was making basic observations through his telescope and started to realize that there's canali, is what he called them on Mars. What he appeared to be observing were ancient canals that possibly were created by some type of you know uh, uh, alien race at the time. They were thinking that it's possibly like intelligently built canals connecting waterways, kind of like what we do here on Earth. So that unfortunately died out, the idea that there was, a, you know, a, an advanced canal system. But what is interesting about the topic is the idea is that is there ever or is there even now water on Mars? And as you can see from these current Mars images, we do have polar ice caps. But we'll take a closer look at some of the surface features as well. This is just another, uh, uh, just a diagram more in the day of Scaparelli where he, you know, again, carved out all these intricate, what he appeared to think were canals, all intricately connect, connected to each other. Now, we've sent several probes to uh, the surface of Mars, as well as in orbit around Mars. This is one of the recent ones, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, and I've been following these for like 10 years, uh, back in the day when they first sent the Mars Global Surveyor. So it's, it's a very interesting advance advancement that they've been making in the fields of, uh, you know, space telescopes and, and being able to have better um, image detection capabilities for what they're looking for on the surface. So, you know, it's very uh, noteworthy to see that uh, if we just look at some of the packages that we've sent over the last decade, we started collecting packages where we thought, you know, 15 gigabytes of data, uh, of public data, is quite a bit, but you can see that it's literally exponentially grown uh, over the last few years into the fact that now the public amount of data that's being released is just exponentially larger than we've ever had. And, you know, this is supposed to be some of the most powerful technology that we'll have. So we're going to take kind of a closer look at how this technology is being used to take image, imagery of the surface of the planet and how it's used over certain areas versus other areas, uh, 
does raise a little bit of concern. Uh, you can see that this is one of the latest, uh, you know, cameras attached to the orbiter. And, you know, we're talking about some seriously high-grade equipment. And the imaging technology that we have here is just seriously more advanced than we've ever seen uh, in the public sector. So here's that camera we were just looking at. Now, before, we're looking at a standard like a Mars Global Surveyor, which was released in 1998. This was, uh, you know, 150 centimeters per pixel resolution which, you know, is again, if you get down on objects, all of them are going to become pixelated no matter what they are. But now we're getting down to around 30 centimeters per pixel. And a pixel is a, it's really, really small. So being able to zoom in to a 30 centimeter pixel level is, is really impressive. And that's only the public camera. I, I can almost guarantee you that, you know, we also have classified tools attached to some of these orbiters um, these packages are, you know, usually under Department of Defense and are for public use, but the resolution is much greater than 30 centimeters per pixel. That would probably astound us. Okay, so, you know, again, it's, it's very interesting that we're going to be doing a lot of uh, na analysis of Mars. And even here you can see in this region, just looking at, we see what looks like clear water evidence, evidence that in the ancient past, water was heavily flowing on the surface of Mars and not probably just trapped in the polar ice cap as it is now. But we're gonna come back to some of that uh, imagery and re reanalyze that question of water on the surface of Mars now. Uh, various packages are being deployed. They started off with something again around 10 years ago called the Pathfinder and now we have Curiosity and various other uh, packages that we're going to be deploying that work in tandem with the orbiters as well as surface rovers. So we are well equipped to, let's say, take analysis of the surface of the planet. Now, unfortunately, these rovers or any of the tools we're using don't have like a, a scooping device that's going to go out and pick up like a bug or something on the surface of Mars. Unfortunately, they're still just doing basic detection tools, looking for amino acids and the signs of life. So for all we know, there could be animals hopping around the orbiter, we might not get publicly released images of those, and the tools aren't going to be able to capture anything on the surface. Uh, mainly, again, the tools that we have are going to be used for being able to just do, you know, simple measurements and uh, microscopic analysis of, of, of samples right there on the surface. And this is important because we've seen in the past that, uh, you know, the the things that we found um, that have come to us from Mars, this is actually a, a famous a sample that was found in Antarctica from a meteorite that we know is from Mars. And in it, close up, we see what are clear signs of biological life at a microscopic level, similar to what we have here on Earth. The clear signs of life coming from Mars in the ancient past. So it's very possible that there's current life there now based on the fossilized remains that we've been able to uncover from meteorites. Now again, we're going to have quite an array of scientific packages that are going to be deployed in the next 10 years. And really anyone who's interested in finding out our future in returning to Mars, and I say returning to Mars because as we'll see, there's definitely a deep connection with Mars in our past, and it turns out that even most, some of the most ancient cultures, the Sumerians, as we learned in Lesson 1, had great knowledge and information that Mars was used by the Anunnaki as a way station. That all the mining and efforts that they were doing on Earth, they actually used the surface of Mars to, trans, uh, to transfer the gold from Earth on its way to Nibiru as a way station on Mars before it would do its final liftoff uh, for Nibiru. And we know that they were mining gold on Earth, taking it to Nibiru and repairing Nibiru's atmosphere. Now, this is a whole other topic that we'll get into in a future lesson, but we definitely know that Mars has had a big part of the history in the ancient astronaut theory. So it makes sense that NASA is probably well aware of some of the artifacts and things on the surface that are part of the overall picture, and we have a very large interest to continue to explore the surface of Mars. Now, I'm not saying that there's a cover-up at NASA. Again, as I've found out, there's many astronomers and technicians and engineers 
that might work on a certain scientific package to deploy a certain arm on the rover. But, you know, that's about it. Now, at a higher level, though, the mandates and things set forth around what imagery can be released and what areas of Mars they can show us, uh, this is some interesting topics because there we do have to wonder if NASA, National Administration of Space Science, National Aeronautic Space Administration could possibly stand for never a straight answer. And that's just a joke, of course, but let's just kind of look at some of this information. Since the 1998 Mars Global Surveyor, we've been imaging a certain area of Mars called Cydonia that has a track record going back since the Viking orbiter in the 70s when we first took pictures of the surface of Mars. And back then, there were a couple of artifacts that came up over the live feed in the 70s, which they don't do anymore, a live feed, that showed what appeared to be a face and pyramids on the surface of Mars. So it took a couple of decades, Mars Global Surveyor, until NASA and the scientific community officially returned with packages to re-image the surface of Mars publicly. Now, some of the technology that we were seeing being displayed showed things like this. Here is a satellite feed of a surface area, and we're going to zoom in on just this one hillside to look at geological changes over time. And you can see that by zooming in on this area, we have a time-dated stamp of 2002 and 2005. And on just this little hillside, we can track that there's been geological changes of some type of drainage, possibly water, or maybe just some sand and wind that changed the surface from 2002 to 2005. But this is at a 200 meter resolution. It's pretty impressive. Now, keep that in mind as we start to look at other areas of the surface of Mars, because this was first picked up in the 1970s from the Viking orbiter. And as it came down the live transmission, they simply labeled it head. <laughs> and they said that after imaging it uh, at a certain time later, the shadow here uh, caused, caused this light and shadow effect is the way the sun was hitting it. And so under a different lighting condition where the shadow might move over to here, that the face disappears and there's no longer a face. Wow, that was definitely a wrong answer by NASA because several people going through the NASA archives, including myself, have found imagery that basically flushes that right down the drain. Data that shows that this does this definitely does deserve a further scientific uh, um, appreciation. And again, if we were to just zoom in and look at it, even in this raw data, we can make out what appears to be some type of a headdress, possibly symmetry, a clearly clearly a face-like structure, eyes, nose, and mouth. So this really does raise a lot of questions into saying, you know, th this was just a, a fragment of light and shadow. Okay, so we're going to be looking at this one specific area where the face has been located. And what's interesting about this area isn't just that there's a face, but the surrounding structures in this area seem to have been mined or have been connected and possibly are an ancient city that we've now found on Mars. Now, anyone in the topic of ufology might be familiar with Cydonia. It's a very popular topic once you begin looking into the field of ufology or the ancient astronaut theory. But hopefully these lessons can be a good gateway into anyone new to these topics or just being introduced. I also find a lot of people struggle with trying to explain this information, which they might find interesting, but find a hard time relaying it to someone else so that they might get that same spark of interest. Well, that's why ancient school is a great place, is that you can not only share your interests in learning this information with others, but also refer them and say, listen, let's go see for yourself on ancient school. Okay, so, you know, if we look at some of these images up close in more detail, again, these are all from Viking, uh, Viking 1. So this is all data that we originally took in the 70s. We just now, have, over the last 10 years, have revisited these surface structures. And... This is some of the imagery that, that we've gotten in 1998. Now, what you're going to see here is a very interesting track record that, for some reason, other areas of Mars, the geology and the clarity is immaculate, very impressive. But when we get to the face and the pyramids, 
all of a sudden the, the resolution is just thrown out the window. All of our 30 centimeter per pixel high resolution cameras seem to have problems or are being used in a limited fashion. So here's a view of the face in 1998. Now, it still looks like a face. It's very badly eroded. Looks like a bomb hit it, possibly. I don't know. Very bad damage. Something has happened to it, and it's very hard to discern that it's still a face until you look closer. Now, again, we have imaged it in more recent times, and, and, and again, it seems as if it's gotten worse. Now, in the original images of 1976, it was clearly a face. There were even different shadow angles confirming that it's a face. Here we find two different samples from that time frame. Shadow is here. The shadow is not there. The sun is literally right overhead. Like I'm the sun, I'm, I'm hitting the face here. If I'm the sun, I'm hitting the face from here. The shadow is different. The face is still there. 1998, it looks bad. 2001, even worse. 2002, you see where I'm going. Now, every other area of Mars, the face looks excellent. But for some reason, when they get to this area, we start to have problems. Now, thank you to the research of the Enterprise mission and Richard Hoagland, who might actually be giving you future lessons here at Ancient School. You can see that what they found was that by looking at certain other areas using the Mars orbital camera from the, uh, the Global Surveyor, uh, this main camera had a resolution that would look at other areas in great detail. And the resolution that they released for these areas was great. Now, when they took their first images of the face, this is what they released. You had to color enhance it and do data correction to actually see it. And they were only using two thirds of the available 256 color spectrum of a grayscale image. They weren't using the full data. It's almost like they were hiding it. They reduced the resolution. Why? Well, let's take another look. When you look at this face from 1998 and rotate it 37 degrees so that it's looking at you head on, just like as if you were talking to another face, we can still extrapolate quite a bit of data, even from this badly damaged image. Now that I've rotated it 37 degrees, I've created a left half and a right half. And by simply looking at these two halves as individual sections, again, some interesting data can be extrapolated. Again, we've just taken the 1998 image, rotating it 37 degrees. And when I split these two sides and mirror them, some interesting pieces of evidence come out here. In this right side, you can clearly see that even though it's badly, badly fragmented, when I flip it and mirror it, we still see facial characteristics, linear characteristics, forehead, eyes, nose, mouth, possibly a beard. Now, again, that's some data extrapolation. But when we look at this other side, this left side, and mirror that, something else emerges that's too much to just be by chance. And if we look at this again in detail, what we're seeing is clear semi clear symmetry around the headdress. Uh, you know, what appears to be some type of actual amulet, possibly a winged disc, some type of Egyptian pharaonic headdress. I mean, this is coming off of the surface of Mars. What's it doing there, right? There has to be a connection here, which can, coincidentally, the next lesson, of course, is the Mars-Earth connection in lesson three. But as we can see here on the surface of Mars, this face just has too many coincidences to just be a natural phenomenon. Eyes, nose, mouth. So all of this, and looking at it even under closer detail, just reveals too much evidence for us to say that this is by natural chance. Now, it is possible that uh, wind or, you know, certain mountains looked at from a certain angle look like a face. And that's the only way that they've tried to attack this but not with a real mathematical analysis, which we're going to look at here in today's lesson. Now, other areas around the face show symmetry that, again, denote some type of artificial influence. Uh, we saw here in 1976 something near the face that appeared to be looking like a dolphin, but we couldn't really understand what it was. Well, in 1998, we re-imaged this area, 
And this dolphin-like figure, whatever it is, has these perfectly cut or tube-like items that again are showing symmetry that are not that is not natural. Something was being done in this region. When we compare the data from 1976 to 1998, basically what we're seeing here is higher resolution of these uh, initial objects that were filmed at Cydonia. For a long time, this has been called the city, possibly a second face here matching the face, but unfinished, and what appear to be pyramids and a fort of some kind even some type of inner structure of four connected dots and, a, and another pyramid with little nodes coming out of it. And then a very large pyramid down here. Again, the angles on these objects under higher resolution are still being confirmed as pyramids. These are some type of ancient, you know, five-sided pyramids that we can confirm that what we're seeing here is the shadow is hidden in this one. But in this one, now the shadow is revealed, and we see angular consistency. These little four dots, for an example, now you can see those four dots up close. And those three nodes here are here. So it's very interesting consistency that what we're seeing is possibly an ancient city. Now, there's more to it than that. It's not just the objects. It's the placement of the objects. There's actually quite a bit of geometry that matches up, which we're not going to get into in this lesson. I'm just going to give you a very straightforward approach to showing you there's something that's been going on on the surface of Mars. So again, when we look at these structures, this side where the sun, if I'm the sun, this little red dot, I'm now shining on these structures, making a shadow that's coming here. Well, these, now I'm the sun, are right over these structures, clearly showing these once shadowed areas. So in relation to the face, these, in fact, do still merit further study. And there's that little dolphin we saw a minute ago. Now, what's really interesting is that not only are these all in relation to each other, but they seem to have been placed in a certain area, which I'm going to get back to in a moment. If we dive into just the face for a moment, there's never, done, never been any type of actual analysis that says, no, this is a face no matter what angle you look at it from. But actually there has. A gentleman by the name of Dr. Mark Carlotto, who is an imaging specialist, released quite a bit of data in showing that no matter how you look at the 3D imprint of the face, no matter what sun angle you're looking at the face, it's still a face. And pretty much every passing, every test that you can run that would show some signs of artificiality uh, the face passes with, you know, hands down. Now, there were other tests that Dr. Mark Carlotto did that were ingenious in bringing out the data to confirm that the face and surrounding structures are definitely artificial. What we're seeing here is a fractal analysis of the face in two different frames. Here's the face where the angle of the sun, again, if I'm the sun, I'm creating a shadow on the face. There's the shadow. And in this one, the sun is probably right above the face. As you can see, there is no shadow. Two separate frames of the face. When Dr. Mark Collado runs a fractal analysis on these two frames, the fractal analysis shows that the face, all of these little highlighted hits, those are a probability of much higher chance to be artificial. Now, he used these same algorithms on Russian satellite telemetry views over Russia. And using the same fractal analysis, he was able to identify tanks or troops hidden under some tarps or shrubs. So that same type of, uh, you know, aggressive data being run on the surface of Mars, those same algorithms show that the face and surrounding structures come out to be a 98% chance of probability to be artificial. NASA never did any of that type of uh, study publicly. But again, other peer-level review scientists that might not work at NASA have done the research, and this is why it's important to be abreast of this information. Here again is the analysis of the Russian satellite telemetry where you can see what appear to be tanks and other artificial objects that when again run under fractal analysis 
are clearly identified as artificial, just like the face was. So we really have to take that into account that a lot of the things that we get on the surface from our space agencies might just be the foot into these topics, the foot crossing into the door, if you will. But you really need to then take the leap yourself and look at some of the data that they're retrieving from these missions, especially on the surface of Mars. As you're going to see in Lesson 3, the Mars-Earth connection coming next week, <laughs> the data that we've been collecting on Mars, I mean, they should be holding press conferences saying, there's life on Mars, it's confirmed. But NASA doesn't work like that. However, you can freely review all of the data that shows that all the signs are pointing to life is not only prevalent on Mars, but still exists today. So again, just doing that fractal analysis, we can see that these uh, areas, this city and the face were uh, very prominently detected to be uh, artificial. Okay, now there were other strange artifacts on Mars, uh, you know, outside of just the Cydonia region, and I recommend that you definitely check some of these out. I've provided the source material so that you can actually, actually, uh, you know, visit these sites and um, uh, see these things for yourself. Uh, you know, they they are quite interesting to to be aware of simply for the fact that, you know, this is public data. <laughs> if I can get my tool to work here, excuse me, I'm trying to click on the link for you. Um, I can't do it in the presentation. I always get this uh, mixed up, so forgive me. I wanted to click on the link for you, but uh, there, there is always, uh, you know, an interesting correlation between the data that we have, here we go, um, that is, you know, freely available, where, again, it's just these little tiny things. Oh, here's a random image from... You know, we're logged in here, uh, and they give you the area that they're zooming in on. And then, of course, when we really zoom in on this strip, it's not just that one thing that I was showing you that's of interest. There's all these tube-like structures and um, various other things that, that uh, should merit attention. But there's also, again, these things that just really, excuse me, raise a lot of questions. And sometimes it's kind of fun to hunt through these artifacts um, I, I have to actually click on one of these and see in detail what we're looking for. But uh, all of that data that I show in the presentation, all of these frames are available and they're, you know, NASA released for the public. Now, there have been a few other things <laughs> with the surface of Mars that go back into the past and raise a lot of questions. Um, Mars has two moons of, uh, that, that, orbit, uh, that orbit the planet. And the main moon, Phobos, had what we'll call a Soviet close encounter. When the Russians first started to send their own probes and take pictures back in the 70s, one of their probes got very close to Phobos and was hitting it with radar. And the last frame that the satellite picked up was this. And this little beam of light, it's not coming from the satellite. It was coming from the moon of Phobos towards the satellite right before they lost transmission of Phobos-1. So it's very interesting that even, uh, excuse me, Phobos-2, it's very interesting that what we're seeing is possibly some type of energy beam coming from the moon of Mars and basically shutting off one of our spacecraft, saying, you know, you're not going to shoot us with your laser beams. And other things that they were shooting on the surface of Mars at that time are unexplainable. Here was a large surface. Something was on the surface. Now, they were taking infrared, and so all they got was a shadow of some large object, not on the surface of Mars, but creating this shadow above the surface of Mars. This really does raise a lot of questions. I, I can only imagine what's actually going on on the planet Mars, but if we look at anything with our space rec our space track record, when we landed a man on the moon in 1969, it's not like we stopped. We stopped going publicly. All of the information from the astronauts who have now spoken out tell us when they were up there on their tricycles, the military was on the surface of the moon in a Ferrari. They even saw cities on the back side of the moon. It's almost like we're not allowed to travel to these other planets in our solar system. 
probably because they're already occupied. What a journey it'll be to actually see what's going on. Now, the Russians released so much information about what they think is going on on the surface of Mars. There was a British documentary done, and if you can find a copy of this video, you're very lucky. It's called Alternative 3, and while it's fiction, it's definitely based on fact. And it even shows purported landings on the surface of Mars by Russian astronauts and seeing life scurrying outside the window of their, of their capsule. So it really does raise a lot of questions about what's possibly been going on for many decades with our involvement in this secret space program going on with Mars. And it's not just the U.S. This is a global involvement where we're definitely using platforms in space and definitely on other planets currently now. Now, we have to wonder again why we're not being told about all the clear and obvious data that there is an atmosphere to Mars. You can even see it in some of these images. There are polar ice caps, and there's clear signs of water. I mean, look at all this frozen snow on the, on the surface of Mars. I wonder if there's good skiing. There's clear data that shows even now what, what appears to be flowing water. Changes in the, geo in the geography, this is a GIF animation of current data from from ESA that, that shows flowing water, changes of water levels on the surface of Mars. We really have to wonder why this is not being told to us. And there's clear evidence from all of our instrumentation on the surface now that the water levels did exist. All of this is clear signs of an ancient waterbed, a salty waterbed at that. Not only just water, but all the acids and amino acids and and things that are needed for there to be a rich atmosphere of life we see in the ancient areas of Mars that we've been looking at. So I really have to wonder if we do go back to Mars with human beings within our lifetime. I definitely believe that by 2025 there has to be public missions going on. I mean we'll be down we'll, we'll be sending internet controlled live drones by private companies, not government controlled, private companies will have missions where you can control your own space bot, if you will, and look at things on the surface of the planets live. So I really do wonder what's going to happen when we actually get to go back with real people and public, publicly controlled tools. <laughs> I think what we're going to find is that our history on these other worlds within our own solar system is deeply embedded, and of course, especially on Mars. I mean, there's no question that the Anunnaki, the ancient Sumerian gods at least, were using Mars to do mining. The whole face itself was a large monument to be contributed towards one of the Anunnaki gods, Enki. So we have to understand that there is a large and infinite amount of data that we're still going to receive about Mars and, and really that's exciting is finding out all this uh, new data that confirms our ancient connection with Mars. Uh, I definitely would like to point everyone to go to this URL. Uh, you can pause the video and just write that down but I'll go ahead and click on it for you briefly here. Again my hats off to Dr. Mark Carlotto. He's done excellent research and really raised the bar in understanding that these various structures on Mars merit a lot of uh, further study. And thankfully, with his ability to do image analysis, <clears throat> he's really released some great data. I, I personally recommend this book, The Martian Enigmas. Looks like you can uh, buy it in the App Store as well as on Amazon. So pick up a copy of Mark's book. Uh, it looks like he'll even sign it for you. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's probably going to end it for this week's lesson. So I'd ask you to stay tuned for next week where we're going to dive into the Mars-Earth connection.